my prose reviews on my blog and my occasional film reviews here, you know that I enjoy film. And I do try to learn more about it as a medium, because that's what you do when you love a thing. You try to learn more about it. So, when I stumbled across The Story of Film and Odyssey, a series directed by Mark Cousins, on Netflix Instant, I had to watch it. This documentary series is one that has diminishing returns. Cousins is at his best when he's covering film's early days and discussing the evolution of the techniques which formed film, talking about stuff like the 180-degree rule and why it works and why directors like Ozu could get away with breaking it when other directors weren't necessarily able to do so, that sort of thing. That part is interesting, but it's not the show's most interesting part. If you're not familiar with the 180-degree rule, a quick version of it that I can explain without the visual aids that Cousins uses is you try to maintain audience perspective with your thoughts, basically thinking of the material in the scene like a stage setting, with the camera be being the viewer and they're in the seats. The difference is that when you go to play, your perspective as a viewer and the audience is fixed. You have your seat, you stay there. Here, instead, you can, in between shots, run around anywhere you want for the next scene. Anywhere on the audience's side of the stage. You can go into the orchestra pit, you can go up the balconies, you can run all the way back to the cheap seats, you can go sit on the very edge of the stage. However, you can't go up on it. And you absolutely, positively, can't run across the stage into backstage. That completely breaks the... So how does Ozu get away with this? Well, he puts a different background behind each of the participants in the conversation, and make sure that in the first shot, the establishing shot, both backgrounds are visible, so you have your sense of geography established. The example that Oak Cousins uses in the show has two characters sitting at a table and talking, one is their back to the wall, the other is their back to the window. Thus, when we get a shot of those characters, we have their background of the window or the wall, and we, as the audience, know, okay, this is where these characters are in relation to the environment. Now, if you have a three-dimensional environment, where characters will be moving around in a circle, let's say, for example, a TARDIS interior, the way you can get around this, using Doctor Who as an example, this is actually something that the Doctor Who TV movie from 1990 did really well, is give each chunk of the TARDIS interior a different background. This one is the sit, this portion being the sit-down and relax nook, this portion being the giant wall of shelves, this portion being the big spiral staircase or, or, or the, the big staircase up to the double doors and that sort of thing. And because you have these different perspectives, oh, of course, if one side's got the double door, the doors, the front doors of the TARDIS, because you've got all these perspectives and all these different things, you know, okay, here's where I can, and here's where everyone is in relation to everyone else on the TARDIS interior. The early seasons of Doctor Who didn't have this problem because it was a half set. Anyway, moving on. What the film's most interesting part is, or rather the series' most interesting part is, is when Cousins looks at the development of film across the world. Not just in the countries whose films normally end up in the Criterion Collection, like, well, most European countries and the U.S. and Canada and Japan and China and that sort of thing, but going to Africa, to the Middle East, to India, and to Latin America, Central and South America. Cousins does an excellent job of getting across that film is the world's medium of expression, and that dialects of films don't just vary, vary based on the language spoken in the film, but in terms of also the material focused on and how that material is presented. That said, the film has this film series has some notice, notable problems. I'm a fan of Kyle Culgren's work on Browse Held High. He does an amazing job of presenting arthouse film and making it approachable, and, most importantly, he presents those films in a manner where it's clear that while certainly in his early episodes he had a more snarky duty persona, he never, ever, not when he was putting on a persona in the beginning, nor now, became the stereotypical film critic who thinks that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were traitors against cinema and belong alongside Hitler on the time travel murder list. I am looking at you, Peter Biskind. Cousins, on the other hand, falls into that trap. Not as hard as Biskind does in um, Easy Riders Raging, Bull, um, Easy Riders, uh, Raging Bulls, but from the filmmakers he highlights in the material he covers. Cousins is definitely the mindset where he feels that Dogma 95 was a great idea and should have caught on more heavily. 
and similarly buys heavily into the auteur theory of cinema, where all films are effectively the vision of a director, or maybe a director and screenwriter, and everyone else on the project basically exists to carry out that vision. I, on the other hand, don't like Dogman 95, and I don't really buy into auteur theory. Auteur theory feels to me like great man history for film snobs, and it rejects a whole bunch of cultural, philosophical, economic, and global influences in cinema, and minimizes the impact of everyone else who works on a film project, from the Foley artists, to the grips, to the editors, to the cinematographers, to the actors themselves. Similarly, Dogma 95, to me, takes auteur theory and adds on to it kind of the level of anti-intellectualism you find in the hardcore punk scene. Hardcore punk takes the tack that music should be for everyone, which means that if it can't be played for or played by or understood by everyone, then you shouldn't make it. It, cre it creates an oversimplicity of lyrical themes and oversimplicity of musical techniques, and not just simplicity, but rejection of people who decide to go a little more out there or be a little more experimental. So, for example, Talking Heads has often, have often been lumped into with the punk scene, but hardcore punk would consider that a negative and reject them and that they're doing it wrong and they're bad and they suck because they do more obscure lyrical motifs with their music and do more experimental stuff with their stage show and their presentation. And, for that matter, bring in, like, jazz musicians to play with the band. Dogma 95 takes the tack that sets, effects, major script writing, and so on are just cruft that get in the way of the artistry in film and creating a cinematic experience that is truly real. The problem is, all that stuff in Dogma 95 is in opposition to all the other forms of artistry that come in with those aspects of film, whether it's all the lighting and staging and camera placement that comes with cinematography, with the craftsmanship that comes into set design and miniatures and costume design, to interesting stuff that can come out of the scriptwriter's pen and make create interesting thematic motifs. In fact, hell, if you look at, say, one of the biggest adopters back in the day of Dog 195, Lars von Trier has a ditched Dog 195 entirely. I mean, honestly, like, I enjoy the Lord of the Rings films, and I love them not just because they're a great adaptation of Tolkien's work, but because of the sheer level of artistry in those films. You look at the miniatures and how the crew pulled off all the optical illusions to make it seem like Elijah Wood only comes up to Ian McKellen's waist, and there's just such great artistry there, and to take the stance of Dogma 95 renders that art, says you're declaring that artistry irrelevant or actively harmful to cinema. I mean, you can claim that there's no artistry there, but it's, if you're doing so, it's disingenuous, gratuitous contrarianism, if not outright anti-intellectualism, in my view. And that is, that being anti-intellectualism, is for me one of the greatest sins a critic can engage in. Or an artist can engage in. I'm not saying there's not a place for minimalism in, pro in film. There's absolutely a place for it. It's just that saying one form of filmmaking is or is not truth on the other hand, and thus by being truth is, va is the only valid form of filmmaking, the only real form of filmmaking, rubs me absolutely the wrong way. One true rayism doesn't work in an artistic context, because when you engage in one true rayism, all you're actually doing is you're not putting up other artists, you're not promoting other artists, you're saying, I'm the only true artist. That's not making good art, that's being a douchebag. Additionally, the focus of the series weirdly overlooks some areas. The Hong Kong film industry, particularly on the action side of things, is, as far as the series is concerned, something that began and ended with Bruce Lee, with occasional auteurs like Zhang Jimo and Ang Ni dabbling into the field with House of Flying Daggers and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, respectively. No discussion of how global offense like the Vietnam War were perceived in Hong Kong through films like A Bullet to the Head, or for that matter, how John Woo moved the wuxia genre into the present day through his work on what is now as described as the heroic bloodshed genre, and how what the films he worked on and how the scripts of those films and their direction says about Hong Kong and its place in the world and what 
Wu and the writers of those films were trying to say about Hong Kong and its place in the world. So, never mind the fact that this series completely ignores animation entirely. There is so much material they could talk to related to how some countries where perhaps their film industries were less flush with cash, and so filmmakers would use animation, whether cell or stop motion or something else, to tell other stories, and how the language of film mutates when you remove a physical camera or physical actors from the situation. There's so much you could talk about there, not just about the U.S. and Japan, but Eastern Europe. Hell, there may be a massive animation scene, old schools of filmmakers doing animation work in India, in Latin America, in Africa, all continents and countries which this documentary series explores in depth that we don't hear about because it is that, that school of cinematic presentation is completely downplayed in this series. Maybe it's just a case where animation isn't something that interests his cousins. And if it doesn't interest him, then he doesn't consider it important, so he doesn't talk about it, which is underwhelming and unfortunate, because when you're making a series called The Story of Film, then you're talking about film. You're talking about cinema, not just in one form, not just in live action and celluloid and that sort of thing, but in kind of all its iterations. You can say, oh, I'm limiting myself to feature films, things shown in theaters. We're not talking about television. We're not talking about um, anything else like that. I'm not talking about direct-to-video. Still, animation plays an important role. And seeing the evolution of how we go from, like, Walt Disney to, well, frankly, anime and everything in between and everything else that happens everywhere else, that's an odyssey worth taking. And that's the other subtitle of this, the story of film and odyssey. And that part of animation is an important part of that odyssey, and seeing it so ignored is unfortunate. Do I recommend this series? I do. With reservations. The first half of the series is fantastic. It does a really good job of laying the groundwork, not just for the evolution of film in terms of the artists, but also film in terms of the artistic techniques. It's like seeing a the film, a documentary series about the history of painting, going from, oh, mosaics in ancient Rome and all that sort of stuff, all the way to introduction of perspective, horizon line, uh, the horizon line and that sort of thing, to, well, surrealism and pointillism and all these other various art styles that come out over the dawn of the 20th century and where these artistic styles and schools come from. That part's great. As the series goes on, though, it runs into ruts. Cousin's stance is that innovation never happens in the mainstream, and any innovations that do happen there are only worth noting in the context of the real art that's happening elsewhere. And again, my view is, all art is real art. You may consider some art to be better than other art, and that's certainly a very subjective but that, that, that's a totally subjective thing. That doesn't mean that Cousin's perspective is wrong for him. But when you overlook perhaps things that may have been in the mainstream but are may have fallen to the side and been forgotten, you have gaps in your story. You brush things over in your story and you have a tech that doesn't necessarily work as well. Martial arts films were certainly in the mainstream in Hong Kong. That doesn't mean they're not worth talking about in relation to film cinema and the rest of the world and how it influenced film cinema and the rest of the world, and how it influenced filmmakers and directors in other countries. This creates a situation where, if you get frustrated over someone arbitrarily deciding what is or is not real art, real art, then you won't enjoy the series as much as you approach the last four episodes, which is the case that I ran into. I loved the first half. When I started getting into, of the 15 episodes, started getting into the back seven. The first three of those were kind of, eh, but I dug it. It was cool. It was neat. Seeing this, these color cultural elements of cinema of the 1960s and 70s and 50s, for that matter. But then we started getting into the 80s, 
90s and we started getting into this tack that real cinema is not the stuff that comes... It is ultimately what I describe it as is real cinema is not the stuff you've heard of. If you've heard of it, it's not real cinema. Unless it's the unless it's the stuff you've heard of that he does talk about, like David Cronenberg and Videodrome, for example. It was not countercultural, and it's not real cinema. And that doesn't work for me. So watch the first half. Watch the second half with a grain of salt. But otherwise, it is certainly worth watching. I will probably check out, the if I can find a copy, the companion book and see how it compares. It may be that the companion book fleshes out some concepts better than the show does, which is actually kind of a disappointment, but we'll see if I can get to that. And when I find the book, if I find the book, I will do a separate video on that topic. <laughs> Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see it or view previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you mentioned in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching. And see you next time.